the destruction of the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, is one of the Old Testament's more gripping stories, a great tale. But does it have any basis in historic fact? As it turns out it just might. Recently, scholars released a report about an ancient city near the Dead Sea, where Sodom and Gomorrah were supposed to have been. It was destroyed by an asteroid airburst, an event that could well have provided the basis for the biblical narrative. Below are 30 things about that and other lesser-known ancient world facts. The Fiery Destruction of Sodom In both the Bible and the Quran, the city Sodom and Gomorrah are cautionary examples of divine punishment as the wages of sin, in the best-known account, that contained in the Old Testament's book of Genesis, God informs Abraham that Sodom and the nearby city of Gomorrah are to be destroyed for their wickedness. Abraham pleads for the lives of righteous inhabitants, especially his nephew Lot and his family. The Lord agrees to spare the cities if fifty good people could be found in them, a figure that Abraham bargains down to ten. Two angels disguised as men are sent to Lot in Sodom, only for a depraved mob to demand that he hand over his guests so they could slake their lusts upon them. The horny mob turns a deaf ear to Lot's entreaties, so the angels blind the crowd, tell their host to get out of the city ASAP with his family, and not look back. As God rains down fiery destruction upon Sodom, Lot's family flees and is spared the heavenly wrath. Except for Lot's wife, who looks back and is immediately turned into a pillar of salt. All in all, a great story packed with action and drama, but is there is any basis for it in ancient historic facts? As seen below, there just might be. Not the bits about angels and wives getting turned into pillars of salt, but the part about the heavens raining down fiery destruction upon a city. The horrific sudden disaster that befell this ancient city. One day circa 1650 BC, the inhabitants of a Bronze Age city, a few miles northeast of the Dead Sea went about their daily business, blissfully ignorant of the doom headed their way, unbeknownst to the residents of what is now known as Tel El Hammam, archaeological site in Jordan. An unseen icy space rock was hurtling their way at a speed of 38,000 miles per hour. As it ripped through the atmosphere, the small asteroid left a fiery trail in its wake, before it burst about two and a half miles above the ancient city. The explosion was roughly 1,000 times more powerful than the nuclear blast that destroyed Hiroshima. Those unfortunates whose eyes had been focused on the plunging space rock when it blew up were instantly blinded, in a minor mercy, they did not have long to contemplate their loss of sight. In a flash, Tel al Hamam was transformed into an inferno. Wooden clothes burst into flames, while pottery, bricks, swords, spears, and metal began to melt as air temperatures spiked about 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. A few moments later, the shockwave arrived. Those people and every animal perished, mangled, ripped apart, their bones broken, and their body parts burnt. The shockwave continued on, and a minute later, slammed into Biblical Jericho about 14 miles west of Tel el Hammam, and brought down its walls. As seen below, scholars believe that this ancient catastrophe gave rise to the biblical narrative about Sodom and Gomorrah. A biblical narrative based on a real-life ancient natural disaster? For a decade and a half, archaeologists oversaw excavations by hundreds of people at Tel El Hammam. Their findings were examined by dozens of scientists in the U.S., Canada and the Czech Republic. One thing that jumped out was a five-foot-thick layer from around 1650 B.C., comprised of charcoal and ash, intermingled with melted metal, melted pottery, and melted bricks. There was also shock quartz, generated at pressures of 725,000 pounds per square inch or more, and diamonds, wood and plant particles turned tough as diamonds under great heat and pressure. It was evidence of an intense firestorm, but not one caused by ancient warfare, earthquake, or volcano, they don't generate enough heat to melt metal, pottery, or bricks. The only known culprits that could inflict such damage are nuclear blasts and asteroid airbursts. Nuclear weapons were unknown 3,650 years ago, so that narrowed it down. The site in the region for miles around Tel El Hammam was abandoned for centuries after the disaster. It is believed that the explosion vaporized and deposited so much Dead Sea salt water in the area that it became impossible to grow crops. It took about 600 years before rainfall washed out enough salt to render the soil sufficiently productive for habitation to resume. Accounts of the ancient city's obliteration were likely handed down over the generations, and a version probably made it into the Old Testament as the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Similarities about cities near the Dead Sea destroyed by fire and rocks from the sky make it plausible 
even likely that the biblical narrative can be traced to the air burst that demolished Tel El Hamlam. The Seven Wise Men of Ancient Greece Ancient Greek tradition bestowed the title Seven Wise Men, or Seven Sages on seven statesmen, lawgivers, and philosophers, who lived circa the 6th century BC, they include Pittacus of Mediolini, a general who ruled the island of Lesbos, Pittacus tried to reduce the power of the aristocracy, and governed with the support of the commoners. Another was Thales of Miletus, a philosopher, mathematician, and astronomer whose advice Know Thyself was engraved on the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. The wise men's numbers include Bias of Priene, flourished 6th century BC, a skilled advocate known for his probity, and defense of what was right. Chilon of Sparta, who also flourished in the 6th century BC, was a politician who played a key role in establishing the militarized structure of the classical Spartan state, and coined a proverb that translates as brevity is the soul of wit. Solon was a reformist legislator, who established the framework for what became Athenian democracy, opinions differed about the 6th and 7th sages. They are variously given as two of the philosopher Anacharsis the Scythian, flourished 6th century BC, Cleobulus, Pyron of Lindos, Periander, Pyron of Corinth and the philosopher Mycen of Chennai. The Most Influential of the Seven Wise Men Of the ancient Greeks' seven wise men, the most influential was probably Solon, who established the foundations of what eventually grew into Athenian democracy, Nicknamed the lawgiver, he is credited with reforms that ended the aristocracy's exclusive control of government, and replaced a political system dominated by a blood nobility, with an oligarchy controlled by the wealthy, regardless of pedigree. The reforms were a necessary response to major transformations in Athens' economic, and thus political landscape. For millennia, wealth had been based on land ownership, which ownership was disproportionately concentrated in the hands of a hereditary aristocracy, as in the rest of ancient Greece Athens was dominated by nobles who owned the best land, and thus monopolized government, the Athenian region of Attica was made of three parts. There was the plains region, a prosperous agricultural interior. There was the coast district, which relied on fishing and trade. Finally, there was the hills district, an impoverished region that contained a majority of the population, mostly shepherds and small farmers, who scratched a meager living from the poor soil. Then things began to change, Changed circumstances threatened to plunge ancient Athens into civil war. Over the centuries a pattern had developed in ancient Athens, and the surrounding region of Attica, in which poor farmers borrowed seeds from rich aristocrats to plant on their small plots, they then repaid the loans at harvest time with grain, and labor on the aristocrats' estates. That pattern was disrupted in the 7th century BC, when commerce revived after a centuries-long slump. The non-aristocratic Athenians of the coast district got into seaborne trade, and bought land with their profits. The new class of traders and businessmen then used slave labor, to farm their newly acquired estates more efficiently than the traditional aristocrats did theirs, as a result, Athens' nobility found itself outcompeted by the nouveau riche tradesmen. So they squeezed their poorer neighbors, and enslaved them and seized their farms whenever they failed to repay their seed loans on time. That outraged other Athenians. Not because they objected to slavery per se, but because they objected to the enslavement of fellow Athenians. A compromise that worked, probably because it left nobody happy. Outrage over the ancient Athenian aristocrats' enslavement of poorer citizens mounted steadily, combined with the resentment of the middle tier of farmers, craftsmen, and the rising merchants at their exclusion from government, it brought the polis to the brink of revolution. So the citizen body met in the ecclesia, the Athenian assembly, to try and hammer out a solution that would avert a destructive civil war. They entrusted Solon, a respected aristocrat to reform their city-state, and bound themselves with Solomos to accept his decisions. Solon came up with a set of structural reforms that solved the immediate problems, even as they upset all sides, the rich were upset by Solon's new laws because he cancelled debts, freed the debt slaves, and prohibited the future enslavement of Athenians. The aristocrats were upset because the new laws granted the vote to all adult male citizens, regardless of class or wealth. The wealthy were subdivided between the aristocrats and the rich non-aristocrats because some government positions were reserved for aristocrats, to the exclusion of the non-noble rich. As seen below, the poor also had reason for discontent. The reforms that established the foundations for ancient Athenian democracy 
While ancient Athens rich stewed over Solon's reforms, the poor also had some bones to pick, they were upset because Solon's laws did not return the lands that had been seized by the aristocrats, refused to break up the big estates and redistribute the land, and because he reserved all posts in the Athenian government for the wealthy. Despite the widespread discontent, the Athenians kept their promise to accept Solon's decision. That done, and in order to avoid the need to constantly have to defend and explain the reforms, he left the Athenians to work out the kinks in his new system. Solon hit the road to travel around the ancient world, and informed his fellow citizens that he would be gone for at least ten years, his reforms alleviated the immediate crisis and averted civil war. However, they did not resolve many of the deeper tensions that would continue to plague Athens for years to come. Solon made all citizens equal before the law and reduced the power of the aristocracy, which was a significant step towards democracy. However, it still took generations of reformers to build upon, and fine-tune what he had created before Athenian democracy was established. Woolly mammoths were still around when the pyramids were built. Woolly mammoths like Manny from the Ice Age animated movie franchise flourished in the Pleistocene epoch, and lasted into the Holocene in which we now live. The now extinct pachyderms were roughly the size of modern African elephants. Males reached shoulder heights greater than 11 feet, and weighed in at around 6 tons. Females reached nearly 10 feet at the shoulders, weighed around 4 tons, and calved newborns that were around 200 pounds at birth. The furry pachyderms are most commonly associated with the Ice Age. Their shaggy coats were comprised of outer layers of long guard hairs atop a shorter undercoat that made them well adapted to the harsh winter environments of their frozen era. Other evolutionary woolly mammoth adaptations included short ears and tail to minimize heat loss and frostbite. They were thus able to thrive in the mammoth steppe, the Earth's most extensive biome in the Ice Age, which extended from Canada and across Eurasia to Spain, and from the Arctic Circle to China. We commonly associate them with the Stone Age, but as seen below, woolly mammoths still existed when the Great Pyramids of Ancient Egypt were built. Just when exactly did woolly mammoths go extinct? Woolly mammoths, scientific name Mammothus primigenius, are among the extinct species that are better known to science. Paleontologists have not only discovered complete fossils, but also recovered entire frozen carcasses of woolly mammoths in Alaska and Siberia. Some of those frozen finds were remarkably well preserved, despite the passage of thousands of years. That enabled scientists to not only recover their fur, skin, flesh, and stomach contents, but also woolly mammoth DNA. Today, scientists are busily reconstructing the extinct pachyderm's DNA. Indeed, scientists have made such great strides in the reconstruction of woolly mammoth DNA that we just might be able to someday to extinct the species and bring it back to life. It is quite possible that within the lifetime of many or perhaps most people alive today, woolly mammoths might once again walk the earth. But when, actually did woolly mammoths go extinct? The last ice age ended about 12,000 years ago, circa 9700 BC. It is widely assumed that woolly mammoths must have vanished sometime around then, if not sooner. What is the truth about that assumption? Woolly mammoths still existed when ancient Egypt civilization arose. Contrary to popular perceptions, woolly mammoths did not vanish when the Ice Age ended around 12,000 years ago, give or take a few centuries, while no man ever saw a live dinosaur. Mankind and its hominid ancestors did share the planet with woolly mammoths for hundreds of thousands of years. The Ice Age pachyderms were actually still around while the ancient Egyptians were busily engaged in the construction of the Great Pyramids. Most woolly mammoths were hunted by humans into extinction and disappeared from the continental mainland of Eurasia and North America at some point between 14,000 and 10,000 years ago. The last mainland population, in the Kitik Peninsula in Siberia, vanished about 9,650 years ago, however small populations survived in offshore islands, such as St. Paul Island in Alaska, where woolly mammoths existed until 5,600 years ago. The last known population survived in Vromel Island, in the Arctic Ocean until 4,000 years ago, or roughly 2,000 BC. That was well into the era of human civilization and recorded human history, and centuries after the Great Pyramids of Giza, whose construction concluded around 2560 BC, had been built. The Nomads Who Terrorized the Ancient World For thousands of years, the nomadic inhabitants of the Eurasian steppe terrorized the civilized lands on their periphery with frequent raids, on those occasions when they were unified under powerful warlords. Their fear factor skyrocketed, 
as they launched terrible invasions that could extinguish empires. Steppe nomads had a strategic mobility that allowed them to raid settled lands at will, and depart with their booty before the locals could mobilize a response. They could choose when, where, and whether to fight the forces sent by the civilized lands to bring them to heel. The nomads' strategic mobility was complemented by three tactical advantages. First, their horses gave them battlefield mobility, which made to it difficult for adversaries, who were not also similarly equipped with horses to force them to fight to the death. If things began to go wrong for them the nomads could usually retreat, and live to fight another day. Second, their preferred weapon, the recurved bow, led to tactical mismatches that afforded a standoff distance from which to kill in relative safety. They could thus attrit less mobile armies with arrows until they were weakened and demoralized, before they swept in to finish them off. As seen below, the most important advantage was the third. A tough life on the steppe made its warriors formidable and fearsome. The final and greatest advantage enjoyed by the steppe nomads was their very persons, their upbringing in the harsh steppe, with much of their lives spent on horseback, created a deep pool of hardy warriors. In the settled lands only a minority of the population could be mobilized as fighters, because most people are needed in the fields and workshops. The steppe nomads had no fields and little manufacture, while their food source, their animal flocks and herds, could be tended to by children and women. That left nearly the entire adult male population of fighting age available as warriors, the one saving grace that allowed civilization to survive is that it was difficult to unite the steppe clans and tribes. To bring together the fractious nomads in sufficiently large numbers to overwhelm their civilized neighbors was a bit like herding cats. While small-scale raids on settled lands were a near constant, leaders of the caliber of a Genghis Khan or Attila the Hun, who could realize the steppe's full and horrific potential, were few and far in between. The Fearsome Ancient Scythians Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun are the most famous steppe leaders, but there were others who in their day gave their civilized contemporaries no end of trouble, one such was Identhyrsus, a 6th century BC king of the Scythians, a nomadic Iranian-speaking tribal confederacy that inhabited the steppe, between the Carpathians and central China. The Scythians controlled an overland trade network that connected the Greeks, Chinese, Persians, and Indians, and they formed the first of the steppe empires that terrified the adjacent settled lands for millennia. In the 7th century BC the Scythians began to raid into the Middle East, their first major disruptive role was the key part they played in 612 BC in the destruction of the Assyrian Empire, an event that forever extinguished a nation that had existed for over a millennium, and that had dominated the ancient Middle East for centuries. In 513 BC King Darius I of Persia sought to end Scythian raids on his empire once, and for by conquering the troublesome nomads. As seen below, it did not go well. An ancient Persian king's attempt to tame the Scythians. King Darius I assembled a huge army and launched an invasion along the western Black Sea coast, and into today's southern Ukraine and Russia. The Scythians simply retreated into the vastness of the steppe, took their families and herds with them, and avoided the decisive pitched battle sought by Darius. King Ivan Thyrsus laid waste the countryside, blocked wells, and destroyed pastures, and all the while, his warriors attrited the invaders with skirmishes and hit and run attacks. A frustrated Darius challenged Identhyrsus to stop his flight and fight, or admit his weakness, submit, and recognize the Persians as his lords. The Scythians' response, as recorded by Herodotus, highlights just how difficult it was to bring turbulent nomads to heel, and force them to fight if they did not want to. Identhyrsus replied to Darius, This is my way, O Persian. I have never fled in fear from any man, and I do not flee from you now, we have neither cities nor cultivated land for which, we might be willing to fight with you, fearing that they might be taken or ravaged, as for lords I recognize only my ancestors Zeus and Hestia, as to you calling yourself my lord, I tell thee to go weep. Darius had to give up and turn back, and his invasion amounted to little more than an expensive, and fruitless demonstration Scythians continued to raid the Persian Empire for centuries, after until its destruction by Alexander the Great, and continued to raid the former Persian lands for centuries beyond that. Darius got off light compared to this predecessor on the Persian throne. Darius got off relatively easy in his failed attempt to conquer his steppe nomad neighbors, he wasted time and effort and money, and suffered some embarrassment and loss of prestige, but came out a bit alive. Not so Cyrus the Great, the greatest king of ancient Persia, founder of the Persian Empire, 
and one of Darius' predecessors. Cyrus experienced a fatal debacle when he took on the Masajdi, a nomadic confederation that stretched across the Central Asian steppe, from east of the Caspian Sea to the borders of China. They were led by Tomaris, flourished 500s BC, a formidable warrior queen who defeated Cyrus, and brought his brilliant career of uninterrupted conquest to a sudden halt in 530 BC, as recounted by ancient sources, the Masajdi were nomads who spoke an Iranian language, and led a hardy pastoral life on the Eurasian steppe. They tended their herds most of the time, interspersed with raids into the civilized lands that bordered the steppe. Their raids eventually grew too bothersome for Cyrus, who had recently founded the Persian Empire, and whose realm now encompassed many of the territories subjected to Masajdi attacks. The Ancient Nomad Queen Who Did in a Great Conqueror Cyrus the Great led an army into the steppe to bring the Masajdi to heel, he won an initial victory against a nomad contingent commanded by Queen Tomaris' son, with a ruse in which the Persians forgot a huge stock of wine in an abandoned camp. The Masajdi captured the wine, and unused to the drink, got gloriously drunk. Cyrus then turned around, fell upon the inebriated nomads, and killed many of them, including Tomaris' son. The Masajdi queen sent Cyrus a message in which she challenged him to a second battle, and the overconfident Cyrus accepted. She personally led her army this time. As described by Herodotus, Tomaris mustered all her forces and engaged Cyrus in battle. I consider this to have been the fiercest battle between non-Greeks that there has ever been. They fought at close quarters for a long time, and neither side would give way, until eventually the Masajdi gained the upper hand. Most of the Persian army was wiped out there and Cyrus himself died too. The Persian army was virtually wiped out. After the Battle of Tomaris had Cyrus' corpse beheaded and crucified, she then threw his severed head into a vessel filled with human blood. According to Herodotus, she is quoted as having addressed Cyrus the Great's head as it bobbed in the blood, I warned you that I would quench your thirst for blood, and so I shall. Artemisia, the formidable ancient warrior queen, Queen Artemisia I of Caria, flourished in the 5th century BC, ruled Halicarnassus in Caria a satrapy, or province, of the Persian Empire in southwestern Anatolia, she was the daughter of the king of Halicarnassus, who named her after the Greek goddess of the hunt, Artemis. In addition to a queen, she was also a formidable naval commander, who fought for Persia's king Xerxes when he invaded Greece. Artemisia was most famous for her role in the naval battle of Salamis. Her side lost that engagement, but she nonetheless distinguished herself in combat. When Artemisia came of age, she married the satrap of Caria, and after his death, she assumed the throne of Caria as regent for her underage son. Ancient reports depict her as a courageous and clever commander of men and ships, who was an asset to Xerxes when he decided to invade Greece. She demonstrated that she was a capable commander and a tactician in the naval battle of Artemisium, 480 BC which was fought simultaneously, with the more famous battle of Thermopylae. She so discomfited the Greeks in that engagement that they put a sizable bounty on her head, and offered 10,000 drachmas to whoever killed or captured her. The reward went unclaimed. The only Persian naval commander worthy of mention by Herodotus. The naval battle of Artemisium was followed by the even greater naval battle of Salamis soon thereafter. Herodotus describes Artemisia as the only commander on the Persian side worthy of mention, I pass over all the other officers of the Persians because there is no need for me to mention them, except for Artemisia, because I find it particularly remarkable that a woman should have taken part in the expedition against Greece. She took over the tyranny after her husband's death, and although she had a grown-up son and did not have to join the expedition, her manly courage impelled her to do so. After the Battle of Salamis, Artemisia escorted Xerxes' sons to safety, after which she fades from reliable ancient history records, Legend has it that her end came after she fell madly in love with a man who ignored her, so she blinded him in his sleep. However, her passion continued to burn hot despite his disfigurement. To rid herself of her feelings for him, she decided to leap from a tall rock that reportedly held mystical powers, such that jumping off it would snap the bonds of love. Instead, she fell down and snapped her neck. Solon returned to ancient Athens to find factionalism and a would-be tyrant. As seen above, after he enacted his reforms, Solon left Athens for a decade. When he returned, the lawgiver discovered that his city-state had divided into regional factions, one of them controlled by Pesistratos, a popular general. Solon suspected that Pesistratos planned to overthrow the government, and set himself up as a tyrant. He was not wrong. 
To be fair to Pesistratos and other ancient Greek tyrants, however, it should be noted that the word tyrant in that time and place did not carry the modern connotations of brutal oppression. Instead, a tyrant was more narrowly defined as a populist strongman who, often with a support base of commoners excluded from power by an aristocracy, overthrew an oligarchy and replaced it with his own one-man rule. Many tyrants were wildly popular, except with the aristocracy and the aristocrats, whom they had removed from power, of course. Commoners had little power in the aristocratic system, so they were no worse off ruled by one tyrant than, when they had been when they were ruled by a clique of nobles.